I'm not really sure what you've heard already today, but uh, greetings from Estonia, where it's just half past five in the afternoon. And um, I was given a rather long title by um, Rebecca, but I'll shorten it a little bit to this tree health landscape change and the long view. And what I want to do is to put things, I think, in a little bit of perspective and maybe challenge things and maybe, you know, maybe be a little bit skeptical about, uh, about some of the issues that, uh, that we're considering and just maybe make it more interesting for, from a discussion point of view. Uh, the starting point that I look at things is that actually the landscape and the environment is a process of change at different rates. And if we have a human lifetime of about three score years and 10 or 80 years or 90 years, we might or we might not experience some of the rarer major environmental events like a one in 300 year flood or storm. And when we do, we think it's terrible. We think it's really unusual. We think it's the end of the world, apocalyptic and all this kind of thing. And it is quite normal for us to want stability in our environment and to see changes as being negative. But let's also remember that it, humans are extremely adaptable and we have short memories. So we actually soon get used to changing situations. And that can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing, actually, depending on how you look at it. So I want to really put in one part of this perspective that change is normal. All kinds of changes are normal. Uh, when the environment is really changing any faster or more dramatically than it has in the past, we need a long-term perspective to tell us. And if we look over the period, which we usually do, since the re most recent ice age, and I say most recent because it wasn't the last ice age, there'll be another one yet, there have been many different periods of change. And stability for any time length is a very rare commodity. So there's no such thing as environmental equilibrium in climate or anything else. And therefore, when we talk about climate change, let's say, as a problem, well, we have to understand there's always been climate change. And therefore, climate change per se isn't necessarily a problem, only, of course, if it's going to affect us negatively. <clears throat> now, if we're talking about trees and tree health and the British landscape and, uh, you know, what, what is the risk of uh, all sorts of things? Well, we have to remember that we don't really have a very pristine landscape. We've actually done a pretty good job in the last four to five thousand years of denuding the landscape of trees, deforesting it, and in the recent past, filling the place with sheep and allowing the deer to overpopulate hasn't helped from the perspective of trees and, um, and nature in the landscape. So when we look at this typical image of Scotland and the highlands and the things that everybody thinks is wonderful, we have to remember that we've removed most forests from the Scottish landscape and we've left it what we could really describe as a wet desert. Of course, many people do think it's natural and we may value it for its scenic beauty in its own terms now, but ecologically, it's really a despoiled and barren place, one can argue. And if we take a typical tourist shot, there's a, a Glenfinnan monument, <coughs> on the edge of uh, the loch and in the foreground, oh yes, Rhododendron Ponticum, added here by whoever took this beautiful tourism photograph, without understanding that it's a menace and a seriously invasive pest. So we're not immune to these things, but also people are not very good at understanding that we have these various pests, and we have had them for quite a long time in many cases. So pest plants and pests and diseases are nothing new. We just have to deal with the newer ones, but we've somehow perhaps got used to the older ones. Now, another point I think I'd like to make with regard to introduced species is that as a wealthy maritime trading empire since the 17th through to the 20th century, we enriched our landscape with plants introduced from around the world. And where would our gardens be without them? Where would our botanic gardens be? Where would our forests be without them? So we're so used to having introduced plants 
and uh, of course some of them have become invasive and, and been nuisances like Japanese knotweed and, and all the rest of it, but equally we have had a big benefit from them and we shouldn't uh, get too concerned, I think, about uh, too much cons um, focus maybe on, um, on introduced, uh, introduced versus native plants. <clears throat> And when we look at people like David Douglas, one of those main plant collectors, he brought so many that were used to the landscape, especially Sitka spruce, back in 1831 when it was first introduced. Now it's the most common tree in the country, which is a bit ironic, isn't it, really? And here we have an early picture. It doesn't look like this anymore because it's all been felled and replanted. But that's the first generation of a Sitka spruce forest in the Great Glen, Long Lock. Lucky, a new landscape with a new tree. So if we put it in things in this perspective, we have this really a very cultural landscape with many, many introduced trees, many of which are beneficial, some of which plants are um, a pest and invasive, and along with various animals and so on as well. So we, of course, have experiences, some going back a long time with some pests that have become endemic, like grey squirrels. Others have affected the landscape, such as the Dutch elm disease, which changed the face of lowland England, particularly in the 1970s and into the 80s, or rhododendron, which I was showing, which has become a major pest. Now, living on an island, we've been able to use this isolation to our advantage so that we can quarantine ourselves against some threats. And we have quarantined ourselves against things like rabies, um, although that gives us some interesting alternative perspectives that I'll come on to later. So, of course, we can use this, or we've historically been able to use this, to, to check stuff that's coming into the country. Although less so, what with um, free trade and fewer customs controls and container ships and the Channel Tunnel and all sorts of other things. Well, we can see here a picture of part of Essex following the epidemic of the 1970s with all those skeletons of elms. So yes, catastrophic, yes, a big change to the landscape at that particular time. But I'll come on and consider what effect that's had in the longer term of that um, mass wipeout of, of elms in a minute. And here we have the grey squirrel, which we foresters and landscape architects consider to be a major pest but it's also considered to be nice and cute. And you just see how many people go feed them in Princess Street Gardens. So we do have this um, complex view amongst the, the British and the British public about pests and diseases, liking rhododendron, liking grey squirrels, yet at the same time, not understanding that they're actually a menace and a pest and need to be got rid of, or at least reduced in, in significance. Now, I dare say, that Hugh Clayden has been showing you all these different uh, pests and diseases that we are having to deal with. And I just got this basically from the Forest Emissions website. And I added box blight because it's a big problem in many gardens and parks, but not possibly considered as a forest pest. And of course, there's a few other things as well, like fire blight and so on, that are affecting various, various other species. Um, and of course, we've heard particularly of the uh, Kalara Darabak of Ash in the last couple of years. So clearly, risks may increase over time, and we know that international trade is affecting this, the free movement of goods, the rise of China as an exporter, not only of consumer goods, but also of pests, and the movement of people much more freely with less strict controls at port, so people can bring in things accidentally, um, along with their holiday souvenirs or stuck to their boots. We don't have the kind of controls they have in Australia and New Zealand, where your boots have to be disinfected before you're allowed in, and you have to say if you've been on a farm and all these kinds of things. So this might increase risks, which of course we hope that uh, the plant protection people are going to be dealing with, with good biosecurity. Now, the island existence also, in some ways, perhaps increases vulnerability within the gene pool if we have a limited degree of, of variability amongst some of the um, 
the genotypes of some of the species and uh, and uh, uh, varieties that we have within our population. So maybe that's something else we need to consider. But the other aspect now is that when we're on an island existence, it can also introduce a kind of fortress mentality. Now, that's a good thing. In the Battle of Britain, it was a very good thing to have a fortress mentality and to not be invaded and so on. But when it came to the things like rabies, we had very, very strict quarantines. But living on Europe and me being in Estonia, where, where these things, are, you know, things move around because we're just in the middle of a, of a route of, of animals and pests moving, for example, at the moment we have uh, African swine flu that's moved into Estonia and to Latvia from uh, Russia through Belarus, and uh, it's potentially going to wipe out or decimate anyway the wild boar population and transfer into the domestic pig and into the, um, the pork uh, farming. But it's interesting to see how, how it's been treated and, and how it's been, well, not not done with something like the kind of uh, panic that might have been induced if it got into Britain, should we have had a uh, wild boar, of course. And it's interesting to see how we are somehow, these last decades, perhaps this last 10, 15 years, become very prone to panic attacks as a, as a country, as a nation, through the, the media, through government ministers sometimes, through pressure groups sometimes, and there have been all sorts of threats, <clears throat> real and imagined. Eggs and listeria, you remember Edwina Curry, mad cow disease, SARS, bird flu, uh, Y2K was another fake play that didn't appear like the doom mongers predicted. And we seem also to be having some difficulty in assessing risks. We're unsure how to deal with, with risks, and often we overreact to some risks. Um, and, uh, and end up with this, this panic kind of situation. So don't panic, please. And actually, there's a very interesting book. I know some of you might not like Christopher Booker because he writes for The Telegraph, um, but actually this book's really quite interesting. And you may not agree with everything, but uh, it very much makes you think about the, the state of society and this reaction that we have to uh, different scares. Now, how might we as landscape architects, or how, what I mean, as forest, how might we as foresters respond to some of this? Well, first thing, I think, is the motto for these times, keep calm and carry on. Let's not end up with some panic. I don't know if we are going in that route, but let's not anyway. Uh, of course, we need to be careful where we get trees and shrubs and so on from for landscape schemes. And there's so much nowadays in the horticultural trade um, around Europe, um, importing plants from Holland and Germany. Um, and we know that that's where, of course, some uh, problems like the calara in the ash has come from uh, infected plants imported. So this is something we need to look at clearly, and, um, or even from, from Poland. So we must be looking at the biosecurity of such materials. And yes, it might affect the price, I suppose, if we're, if we're looking at this, but we have to think about balancing the costs and benefits. And we should probably be careful about using clonal material, which of course limits genetic variability and exposes so many trees to, uh, to, to the same effect if they're all, all the same clone of uh, poplar and, and so on. And that was one thing in the, um, in the elm, because all the trees were basically um, grown from root suckers and they were all clonally related and they all went down in one great big vast uh, tranche because they were all basically um, clonally related and, uh, and root suckered and so on. <clears throat> so here's a picture from an unnamed um, nursery that advertises for, um, uh, for selling its plants like semi mature trees and so on um, into the UK. So we really do need to be careful um, when we're using them and, uh, and, and, and what, what biosecurity they have at source and uh, all the rest of it. Um, but another thing we can look at is, is 
how some of these changes have taken place, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, and, and actually has happened in the 30 or so years since we had the big outbreak of the Dutch elm disease. And back at that time, there were some, some people looking for the countryside commission, as it was then, uh, Western of Worthington, about the impact of changes to the landscape from losses of trees, from, from hedges being ripped out, and new farm buildings, and all sorts of uh, industrialization of, of agriculture. And there were all sorts of dire changes predicted um, that would take place. And at that time, I was at the Forest Commission, and we were looking how to replace elm trees with other species to maintain the look of the countryside. And it's very interesting to see a little bit about what's been the result in some sample places. So this is from a, um, a study by the same people looking at, at various landscapes where they took pictures in those days, uh, 1980 or so, and looking at the same landscape 33 years later and saying, well, okay, is it really very different? And it's different, but it's the same. And so actually, it's, it's, I think it's quite uh, telling how when you look at that, you can see, yeah, the woodlands are kind of moved around a little bit, and some of them are tuned and some are newer ones, and some have changed. But essentially, the character seems to me to be quite similar. And we should remember that nature is very resilient, more resilient than we might think. And a lot of things that we call natural disasters are what ecologists would call natural disturbance. And it's a normal part of ecological cycles, and especially in forests. Things like forest fires and so on are actually part of natural cycles. And recovery from disturbance does take time, of course, but not, not ecological terms, only in human terms of time, because we think of the human lifespan and 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and so on. So we really need to think in cycles of 100, 200, and 300 years, not in political cycles. And if nature can be resilient, so can we, especially given how uh, adaptable we are as a species. Um, I suppose some of you in the audience, maybe not the younger ones, remember the great storm in 1987? Of course, it wasn't so um, devastating up north, much more so in the south of England. We're more, young, young, more, excuse me, we're more used to storms up north, but they weren't so much down in the, in the south of England. And remember the famous weather forecast by Michael Fish. Well, it was a major disaster. Or was it? It was maybe a good chance to clear out the senile trees and to rejuvenate the landscape. And it's probably a much more healthy landscape now um, than, it, than, it, than it would have been if such a storm hadn't occurred. And all those big country, country house parks and so on that were already getting over mature with those big old beech trees and so on, well, it's necessary for them to be changed sometimes and to be replaced. I mean, landscapes don't last forever, trees don't last forever, and we have to replace them, don't we? Let's put some faith in science, but let it be good science. Um, knowledge of genetics is improving all the time, and that will help us in identifying... Um, strains of, uh, of plants and, and genotypes which are more resistant to, uh, to the Kawara and all those kinds of things. And let's, let's not get too distracted from using sound technology, genetic modifications and so on, from providing solutions if they're the right ones. And also, pesticides still have a value when in the right places for the right reasons. And naturally, we need to try and maintain genetic variability and to keep the gene banks maybe to be the saviour of ash. We should also be aware of junk science. There's a lot of junk science around, and a lot of stuff is talked and talked up in the media, and uh, people listen to it, and it proves to be um, nonsense, but we just have to know how to uh, distinguish between it. And I think uh, uh, environmental and scientist, scientific journalists often don't know how to, and then the population and the public read the newspapers and websites and listen to the news, and they can't really tell the difference either. Uh, and, and really not going to get uh, triffids and things like this, for goodness sake. It's not Frankenstein science, and let's, uh, let's not worry about that. And finally, 
So we should get up to speed with the issues. We should all keep up to date with what's going on. We should use the right tree in the right place. It may be a native species, but then again, it might not be. And take the long view, which surely is our strength as landscape architects, together with foresters and ecologists, to think long term. And resist environmental correctness regarding the role of native species. So that was quick and I hope, uh, I hope a little bit challenging. So thanks for your attention.